<clears throat> okay, hey folks, how's it going? Uh, quick audio check, hopefully you guys are doing well. We are back, uh, going into a live stream today here on YouTube. Uh, welcome to the channel. As always, we're just going to be doing some uh, live conversation, questions and answers, and a little bit of demo and drawing as we can do so in this new accordion book. Uh, we'll see how many people drop in today. But as per usual, I don't always expect a, a large crowd, which is good. Uh, so that way it kind of keeps the focus of uh, these conversations a bit stronger. But anyways, uh, hopefully you guys are having a good night, day, uh, morning, wherever you're coming from. And uh, we'll just get into it. And uh, of course, you know, it's very open for you guys to ask questions and uh, make comments on things. And I'll try to reply to them as best I can. Do understand that I have no moderator. So I'm the one kind of going in there adjusting and figuring out what questions to reply to if, uh, best I can. So, um, hey, how's it going, you guys? So we're going to jump into this uh, accordion book that I uh, recently just got. It's a new one. So made by the uh, company Etcher, based in Australia. Uh, I'll just be using my fountain pen. I will be doing some watercolor as well, too. I got my watercolors out, the Schmink brand. Uh, so I'll be using a combination of these, um, the, the accordion book, which I have not actually applied watercolor in these just yet. So I kind of wanted to try that out and see how it felt. And um, this is a, a brand new one. So I just started it last night. And I'll be adding to this today. So let me just kind of spread it out here a little bit long, uh, wider. If need be, I'll be adjusting the camera distance a little bit here. So this one's already gotten the initial start. Uh, I'm thinking of actually adding watercolor to this piece. I'll be doing another drawing over here, I would say. Uh, kind of building off of this merman, uh, you know, creature from the Black Lagoon kind of feel of things. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what we end up developing here. Uh, let me just shift my keyboard out a little bit. So, uh, just to give you guys a bit more of a closer up look, let's zoom into this front section. You get a good see as to how uh, a book like this is starting. Um, I usually work with these accordion books initially as a, a page spread, like this one here. And so I'll have access to both these pages. The initial idea as to what I wanted to draw was very much up in the air. I had no idea what I was going to put in the page. Um, but, you know, I was like doing things like creatures and monsters and, and, and you know, those sorts of mythological to uh, movie monster kind of stuff. Uh, just to get the warm up going a little bit. So I wanted to get that initially placed in as well, too. So we have the merman here, League, um, the creature from the Black Lagoon. And um, we have a couple different like marine life fish. And I tend to kind of build off of the thematic nature of the subject matter. So it goes from like, you know, the merman creature to the fish over here. Then I want to do the head study. So I kind of did a head study here based on the same kind of creature, uh, pulling from the same design elements from this one that I had done, which I didn't really design. It was just more of a creative thing in the moment, or on the spur of the moment. So as I had this iteration, as I placed it in there, I then kind of build off of that and then want to do a bit more of a detailed study of the head. And I like doing these kind of things where I actually have some form of imagery uh, to give myself an idea of the picture to get started with. And I like to clarify uh, what some of those things kind of look like afterwards. So off into this page over here, what I'm going to do is continue building off of the same theme. So what I like to do as, not alternatives, but more of a uh, continual direction of expanding on these visuals is to show the um, explorations of different routes and directions I can take based on these kind of same ideas. So what I wanted to do was additional like different head studies based on this kind of animal, or maybe even like a full body study again, maybe like a different pose. Um, or possibly just, you know, um, a similar kind of creature, but with a slightly different design, pose a bit differently. It, it just kind of building off of that, essentially. So what we'll be using is uh, just our fountain pen. This is a uh, Esther Brook fountain pen that we're going to be using. There should be enough ink in here. Let me just double check and make sure I have enough ink. I've been using it up a little bit, so it feels a little bit empty right now. So what I might do, actually, before we begin, is fill this guy up. Let me see if I can find a bottle of ink. I'm going to just open up a new pack here. Didn't mean to open this one up anyways. So here's this ink that I'll be using is the uh, Platinum Carbon Ink. You don't want to necessarily let this sit inside your fountain pens too long, but uh, it works pretty well as, you know, um, as a continual source of ink for any sort of uh, project you're going for. Let me just grab a paper towel just so we don't get ink everywhere. 
doing a bit of a mix-up. And welcome you guys. And again, Jada, thank you for uh, acquiring the Dynamic Bible book. I appreciate that and the support. Hopefully the issue two is being planned tentatively at the moment uh, to come out by uh, the middle of this year, I would say. So hopefully around, you know, maybe Comic-Con uh, or fall if possible. So what I want to do is actually take the converter out. Wipe this down a little bit. We then push out any remainder of ink. Wipe it down again. Submerge it and then we extract the ink from there. A couple of twists. So that's filled up, again, wiping off excess on the edge. Continue the bottle. Usually from here what I'll do is after I put in the converter back into the pen, I put a little bit of a twist the other direction, counterclockwise, to just push that ink and have a little bit of pressure behind all that ink flow. And we're good to go. And this will last me, you know, several weeks. Let's close up this bottle here. So usually I'll carry a bottle of this in my bag somewhere if I'm traveling. Um, it's quite strong glass, so uh, I've dropped it a couple times and hasn't shattered, thankfully. Uh, I've kept it in my bag, travel with it on airplanes and stuff like that, hasn't shattered. So um, it's a pretty strong case, so I'm not really worried about it you know, spilling over or leaking and stuff like that. I haven't had that experience yet. So what we're going to be doing is building off of this kind of um, creature, uh, merman creature. I'm building off of him. And uh, I might actually do another quick head study first here. What I'm going to do is actually expand out this accordion book a bit more. And what I want is it to lay flush. that way there's nothing sitting underneath it okay so what I'm gonna do first is just a quick alternative iteration of this merman creature kind of thing as a head study um, playing with proportion mainly maybe I'll try to elongating the head I can think about a feeling of thought of how I want this head or creature to look, whether it's a bit more menacing, more ethereal. I think I'll raise up his eyes to be a bit higher here. And we're just going straight in, just to play with it. I like these little uh, thin overlap scales we're throwing in, making it almost like even like coral. In a lot of ways. Again, welcome for those that are watching. Uh, if you're here for the first time, you guys are welcome to interact, ask questions, converse on things, talk to each other. Um, I will say that I can't necessarily answer every single question. Um, it, it's more based on, of course, hopefully focus, you know, towards what we're trying to get into. But any other random questions that, have, that come in, I'll, I'll discern whether or not it's something I want to jump into at all. Uh, other than that, my suggestion also is to potentially sketch with me. So use this time if you're sitting and hanging out a little bit. Uh, use this time to sketch and draw where you can you can use a similar you know theme of like merman creature kind of thing, and generate your own iterations. Right now we're doing some heads, so you can even also develop your own version of this. Let's see. Let's push his cheekbone out further this direction. And I want his mouth to split open in this direction here, coming down to this overlap of the mouth part. Combining some of the elements of fish and um, other kinds of animals, potentially. We'll give it some short teeth on top. You have to excuse me, sniffling. I've been, allergies have been kind of crazy today for some reason.
And we'll have the mouth open in this iteration, but we'll make the bottom teeth larger. Kind of want more of a um, deep sea animal feel to him in this version. Push the chin all the way down. Sirius is asking, uh, how do you approach doing studies of heads uh, or animals? Heads meaning, I'm assuming you're talking about like human heads. Um, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, whether it's, it's the human form or the animal form or subject matter that is, it, it, of course, it stems a lot from observation. And, you know, I had a question about this even, not really even a question, more of a conversation. Uh, with a former student of mine who I had a meeting with uh, just a couple nights ago and he had that question of you know what were some of the key components that you really ended up focusing on for teaching uh, when it came to trying to stimulate this idea of you know drawing cre creatively or from the imagination such as we're doing right now because we are drawing from the imagination and we can kind of uh, define this where imagination being where I'm creating something that doesn't exist right but it's being inspired by things that do exist on this planet. So from the animals to the machinery, things that we met made by man or by nature. And we're using that as a form of fuel, inspiration to be able to then generate this visual image that we have on the page. So it is imagined, but it's very much based on something of reality. Um, so I, I kind of label it as more like even creative drawing because uh, I'm taking the information that is there and creatively morphing it and pushing in different direction to concoct this visual image that we have now. If we just said straight imagination, we're we kind of almost think of that word as being, you know, imagining something that doesn't exist at all, right? Or not even based on anything in our world around us. And the question is, well, how would you be able to do that, right? How could you imagine something and create and draw something that doesn't actually exist and has no form of connection to things that we have on our own planet? It's impossible for you to think about what that is. So we have to turn to the things that we are either familiar with or can find as visual stimulus. So in terms of how I begin to study things like, you know, the heads of humans or animal heads, of course, observation is the key. So that was my kind of reply to that where observation is everything at that point, because if I observe enough and there are different forms of observation, they're just straight looking at it, right? There's taking photographs of it. And then of course there's sketching it. I mean, there's many other forms that you can do too by capturing what you see in front of you. So that's the idea of capturing what you have as visual observation. So as you have the observation, uh, then you're building up that visual vocabulary that we usually kind of state in our classes of venomous sketching. The visual vocabulary being kind of the data bank of all the visual information that you can gather. But of course, the problem is memory, right? Uh, memory can be a bit poor for some people. And you can also look at a couple of things and imagine that you have to all of a sudden be able to you know, retain that in some form or fashion uh, to whatever level of percentage of, of recording data that you have which I find to be, you know, very difficult to maintain because I don't have a very good memory. So I can look at a certain type of fish and I can draw that fish for you instantaneously as I observe it in front of you. But to build off a memory, I would have to draw it many, many more times. Uh, then, of course, you know, being able to manipulate the thing by turning it in different angles of views, uh, capturing some of the aesthetics and details, getting some of the functionality and movement that requires even more study of, of observation, you know, so real life to visual photographs to video captured documentaries or whatever case is, uh, we use all those resources to build off of. So when I'm doing something like this, we are doing a creative head study of a creature that doesn't exist, but is inspired by the real world of animals around me. So fish and whatnot. Of course, movies as well too, as other things that have been designed is also then another thing to turn to. Uh, things that have already been created, things that have already been designed for films, games, animations, comics, there are also resources that you could be pulling from as observation, much like you will look at the real world. So you're not copying from those things, but you're being inspired by them, generate your own iteration, right? Hopefully that makes it clear, Sirius, as to like how I incorporate all those tool sources. Let's push his side mandible jaw like this out this way. I feel like he's a little bit more uh, contained and safe. I want this guy to be a bit more sharp and angular and have a lot more spines. So what am I thinking of in my head of kind of fish I can imagine? As I said earlier, deep sea fish, uh, stonefish, um, things like 
what were those really deep seated flat ones uh, that have um, really big mouths? I can't remember the name of that one, but um, you know, there's many kinds of fish like this that are very camouflage oriented. Let's give them some gills on the side over here, a bit of an ear hole. Monkfish, that's what it was, monkfish. Let's keep this up a little bit higher. There we go. Yeah, it's a it's a good comment from Robert in terms of like how I like to be able to uh, create, which is you know it's a box full of parts and pieces, right? And then I'm able to um, play with them and uh, manipulate them and, and you know create interesting things from there. Another way to put it uh, that I do in my classes is I kind of imagine it like a puzzle box, right? So um, this is in terms of having the, the clarity of what we're trying to draw and sketch. Not necessarily for the imagined or creative things that we're doing right now, more for the observational stuff, like again, drawing humans or drawing animals. Uh, I say, you know, how it works in my classes of dynamic sketching is where imagine the subject matter you already have the picture of, right? Uh, as if, you know, for instance, like if I'm drawing a fish, I can look at that fish as a photograph, right? And so that's the top of the box of your package for a puzzle box, right? You know what it looks like. You have the image of it. So then you go through, you rummage through the box, and you try to find all the puzzle pieces to put the picture together, right? But what happens is that as you are trying to put it together, you can find missing pieces, uh, pieces that don't complete the picture. So of course, you know, if we want the complete idea and the clarity of that image, we need to find all the pieces that are necessary to image that. So what we're trying to do as artists or as even as students as training is that we're trying to find all the puzzle pieces by observing or, or looking for techniques or using different tool sets, finding different approaches to then get that complete picture, right? How's it going, Owen? Welcome. So now we're just putting a little bit of texture and bumps and three dimensional surfacing towards the skin and the scaling of this animal creature. We're not going to do heavy amounts of darks and hatching on this one in particular. I'm going to keep it relatively open as I head down above. For those of you that are just joining right now, uh, we had, er well, earlier yesterday when I was sketching and drawing, I had done this piece over here, which I pushed a bit further. And this one I actually will be doing some watercolor on potentially. Um, as we go a bit further on this side, we're doing some head studies of additional kinds of animals and uh, creatures like this. And then I think a little bit off to the right, we'll just do like another posed iteration. Just to like, you know, sketch a bit further, because this is not going to take me very long. In fact, we're pretty much almost done with the head of this guy. So now we're just doing a bit of hatching marks here and there that kind of gives us a sense of surfacing variation. Again, a bit of bumping and texturing. Visual noise, uh, it plays in a more aesthetic manner. Hatching where it's not necessarily for value, so I'm not placing any shadows or gradients and stuff like that. Uh, these are just edges of roughness and surfacing bumps. I don't want to do too much on it, so we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, we're going to shift over to this right side up here in the top. And what I'm going to do is maybe play with a different kind of posing. I'll have it maybe face more towards the front. Um, put his shoulders over here. Arms are going to come out. Body comes down this direction. But the tail will be going across that way. So what I'm doing right now is I'm giving myself a good visual. A visual sense as to like where things are going to go. 
Um, you'll notice I do a lot of this kind of movement with my hand without really drawing. And I, I was actually talking about this to Marshall. I was doing a, a recording session with him a couple of days ago on the weekend. Uh, no, I'm sorry, weekday. And we're recording some lectures and lessons for the plans that he was doing. And I was, you know, when I sketch a lot, I don't necessarily just only talk about technique of the actual methods of what I'm sketching and drawing, but also even like the, the mental process and the physical movements of what I'm going for. And when I do these kind of physical motions, it's really about being able to find placement and allocation of space, scale, even perspectives uh, of things that I'm trying to sketch and draw. So right now, what I'm trying to do is get a feel of where I'm going to place this figure. So I'm going to place his head right about here. So this motion at the moment, I call it a ghosting action. As I ghost the motion, I'm able to get a sense in the feel of how large I want his shape and head to be. I'm not going to draw in the initial shape because that's more of a deconstructive method like dynamic sketching. Uh, we'll just go straight into the details. I'm going to sketch straight into this one. Uh, but do know that in my head, I am visualizing what those shapes could be by actual ghosting of motion, right? So I'm going to kind of pull off the designs off of these heads and put in this one over here. Uh, maybe I'll have him face this direction instead. I'm going to turn his head upwards a little bit. Start with the eye up here. I don't need to follow this exactly. I just want to do it in an iteration that's slightly resemblance to it. And in fact, what I'm going to do is zoom in a bit more. Of course, in my head, I am also thinking of other kinds of creatures that have been designed in a similar fashion, uh, whether it's like, you know, Abe from the Hellboy series to um, even that recent film, uh, which was it? Uh, something water. Dang it, can't remember the name of it. Shape of Water. Which was a very similar design to Abe from Hellboy. Then, of course, the classic creature from the Black Lagoon. You know, for those of you asking about the pen, this one in particular as a fountain pen is uh, a fine nib, F. So there's, you know, several sizes of pen nibs you can get. One that I would recommend in general as a fountain pen is either going to be an F um, or maybe the M. Maybe an M. Uh, EFs I don't really use too much. The extra fines are just way too thin for me. I don't necessarily find that thin of a pen to be... I mean, it's great for detailing, uh, and I like detail work, but I don't need that thin of a sizing because my drawings and sketches tend to be on a slightly larger side anyway, so I don't need a pen that thin. So EFs are good. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. EF is good. EFs I avoid. M size, medium sizing is obviously a broader nib, so I don't mind that. But there is a B, which is a broad nib. I don't go up that high, um, but I tend to stick with the F and the Ms. I do have another Esterbrook fountain pen. This is a company, Esterbrook, that I brought, uh, that I bought a B nib broad, and I had it reshaped. So there are people out there that grind pen nibs to be shaped differently, so it gives you a different stroke of a line. Uh, so that can happen. So you need to go a bit thicker with the nib, so that way a grinder can go in and reshape it for you if you have access to that kind of person. Places to go to find that kind of stuff would be like pen shows, conventions, and they exist, and you know they'd be pretty much all over the U.S. Uh, here in LA, there's one in, it used to be in Long Beach, right, I think, but it's in LA. It happens once every, annually, once a year. I tend to go to it. It's a really fun show to go to. Um, just, you know, if you're a pen collector or if you like to, you know, find new tools, and especially if you're looking for someone who can help you grind, uh, they'll usually attend and they'll bring in their tool sets and they'll shape it for you there. neck down this direction and I'm gonna have his shoulders point up and down maybe up and down that direction instead so again you see the motion of movement I do over here these lines are representing the angle of the shoulder so going up this way I'm thinking of his right shoulder up here left shoulder down here
then I use you know some of the basic principles of what I understand from human anatomy, and I segue into the use of like um, you know scaling and animal parts and stuff like that. Question from Will is, what would you say hinders intermediate artists most from breaking through to new levels? It's an interesting question. It's, a, it's definitely one that probably has many alternative ways of responding to. Uh, and I'm trying to find maybe the best way of how I can maybe give advice to that in terms of you know how an intermediate artist can break to those new levels. Because we as professionals, in, in, in here in the chat, we can have people of varying levels of experience. Some people could be professional, some people could be just starting, others are just hobbyists. But at some point, as you gradually grow and you become dedicated towards this form of art and design, uh, you go through those different stages from the beginner, amateur, towards then, of course, intermediate, to then the advanced level, to the pro. Um, and all of us, as you get to a certain level, go through all those stages, right? There's no really jumping at those points. Uh, all of us, as people who pursue these kind of routes of skill, we face those challenges. So I've had those moments where I felt like as an intermediate stage of trying to find the next phase is really difficult to find. Um, again, mainly because of the fact that, you know, as you're growing, you don't know if the route or the path that you're on at the moment is going to be the best one to follow. Uh, there's a lot of doubt, a lot of self, you know, um, unsurety. And of course, people that are, you know, having many examples that are trying to do their own thing, you follow along in parallel with, and you don't really quite sure if that's the parallel for you or, or not. So we can only imitate at times when we're young, because uh, we're so unsure about our futures and what we can do depending upon our own, uh, you know, skill sets. Um, but you know, in that case, you know, as you are at that stage of being intermediate, how, how do we first define that? How do I know I am an intermediate level? Is it just based on time or is it based on skill sets? And I think it's a combination of the two. Um, could someone who is an intermediate achieve that in a much shorter phase of time than somebody else? Potentially, yes. Uh, but should there be a certain level of time passed until you can maybe define that? Uh, to be able to have enough vis uh, data, you know, collected data to say that I'm at that level where I, I feel like I understand the basics, but I'm not really at that level of being advanced just yet, right? So there has to be time spent to some degree. How much time? I would say at least two years for, in, a, in a committed educational route. If it's just kind of a daily drawing on your own kind of thing, it's, it's really hard to get a sense of that data uh, of the growth and the, and the dip ups and downs in that situation because of the fact that it's so sparse and very spread out. And it's also not necessarily very curriculum-based or structured in education. It's more just your natural, uh, you know, kind of interest and growth will be doing it day to day. Uh, but in a more controlled environment, at a school, university, online stuff, your own personal thing, to whatever the case is, but in a structured, orderly path, two years is going to give you enough information, data-wise, of experience to say that I think I have enough of the basics or not. So first, you have to be able to define that. Do I understand enough of the basic fundamentals to be able to use to some degree? There's no mastership, right? So you know that there's still a lot to grasp and you don't really feel fully confident in those basic skill sets. But you ask, at least understand the terminology, uh, the functions, the applications of them, and of course have enough people around you that also reinforces the uses of them, right? So that's gonna be enough to say that I have enough of the basics covered where I'm, I'm considering myself moving into the intermediate level. But that's moving into it. As you're in the intermediate level stage, and you're in your maybe second year to third year, uh, again, you should have a grasping of those basic fundamentals and start to apply them into creating things of your own. Uh, but at that point, also having a stronger sense of a direction of how you want to use it for a certain pathway in a lifelong venture, whether it's a career path. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily career as a job. It could also be more of a personal thing. You just want to become a certain type of artist and, and, and explore those routes on your own. But Again, it, it takes a certain amount of skill to commit to those things. Um, so, you know, once you get to that point where you feel fundamentally basic wise, you have a good grasping of that and you have a good direction as to where you want to use, what do you want to use it for? At that point is when you would say that you can really consider like, how do I now break past those intermediate points and get to the advanced levels of things? Um, but I think that's the more important part, which is having that clear sense of direction and having good people again, right? So once you have good people uh, as examples around you, they're setting you, uh, giving you 
you know, um, at least an idea as to what's possible. Not at the same level as to where you are, but others that are also on your path, but maybe a couple years in advance. Um, this is why you want to have people of experiences of all degrees of levels, right? And so that way you're able to um, not only just have the data pool of what you've experienced, but also have the data pools of other examples. And so that way it gives you then the potential paths that you can also potentially follow in your own steps uh, to eventually find that for yourself, right? And then it has to happen, which is like that, which is self-discovery. Uh, in time, if you just give it enough, hopefully you will be able to find it, right? I know it's not necessarily an, an answer or a direct thing as to like what you need to do, but those are some of the, I think, the, the um, pieces of the puzzle that are need to be there to help you then get that sense of direction, okay? Maybe that was quite long-winded, but either way. Let's put his chest region here. We're going to actually have his torso and his ribs overlap lower half. Right arm go back this direction. We'll go into his arms first, then we'll do the rest of the body. And we'll answer some more questions as we go. Uh, let's see. So another question here is, uh, what would you say to someone who has a hard time being creative? Uh, I'm getting better at drawing from references, but I have a hard time mixing parts or components to create like your creature in the screen. Now, um, I would say in terms of that is seeing examples of what other artists have done in that example of creating this mixture of stuff, right? The more uh, outcomes that you're able to observe in already established mediums, what that gives you also is a sense of its success and quality. Because you can just be looking at anything, but you'd want to be looking at things that are relatively well received or popular. This is how you can then associate to a successful design or a quality based design not even design, but more of like even a piece of illustration or to the look of something aesthetically, right? Trend-wise. So you kind of want, again, uh, more of that kind of observation of not just the reality of the world around us from animals and, and whatnot, uh, but to also then build your taste in things, to understand what is popular, to, to know what is successful. And to follow those things, you got to be able to, you know, obviously, you know, expose yourself to multi-medium of things around you. And so that as you see how other designers and artists who are experienced are able to do that, uh, you have you have a sense of what the outcome should feel like, right? So as you then develop your own thing, does it match up to that same level of its quality? Now, of course, we can't say that as you're a student, you're trying to match the same level of quality as uh, what you're looking at professionally, but you're reaching for it, right? You're trying to strive for that thing. So keep that in mind. All right, let's go over a bit more to the right. Finish out this arm. Let's get to the lower part of the torso here. He will have a tail. I'm just gonna have it. I was gonna have it initially go that direction. I'm gonna have it move this way. I'm gonna go off the screen for the moment, but we'll come back down a bit further. Let's zoom out just a bit.
Uh, let's see, a couple of the questions. A. Beckles is saying, uh, you were watching one of the previous videos, uh, place a strong emphasis on learning perspective. Uh, would you suggest taking perspective before dynamic sketching? Um, if I was to give you more of a straight answer, yes. Should you take perspective before dynamic sketching, which is the class that I teach? Yes. Uh, however, if you did not, let's say because by chance you just happened to skip it and jumped into my dynamic sketching class, would you not be able to take benefit of it? No, I think you'd be able to actually learn and, and receive quite a bit from that experience. But would you be able to take advantage of more things if you're taking perspective? For sure, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I would recommend you take it if it's fitting within your um, timeline, finances, that kind of stuff. Uh, I would suggest it. Where would you want to take perspective? You know, places like at the Concept Design Academy, uh, a teacher there named Polina is a great instructor. If you go to Brainstorm, there's a couple good instructors there like Charles Lin and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, you can be looking at multiple schools around uh, that can give you access to that kind of resource information. Could you say that, hey, can I just learn perspective on my own? You could, but how will you be able to use it and how confident you'll be? Eh, I think you'll be a bit shaky because it's difficult to learn. Uh, which is why you need a hands-on approach and more people around you to really show you uh, how to take advantage of it, right? So I would definitely take, you know, I would definitely consider uh, taking classes from outside sources. We're gonna imagine like he's actually underwater, swimming around, so it's floating. Bend the leg over here on this one. Sorry, I'm going off the page. Let's see a couple of questions. Luigi is asking with my favorite manga artists. And I have many manga artists that I really enjoy. Uh, I would say, if I would just go off the top of my head, one that I very much find to be a master is going to be Katsuhiro Otomo. Uh, I think Otomo's work is fantastic, of course, from Akira. You know, he's created his opus and masterpiece in his mid-20s. Uh, honestly, even like Miyazaki is amazing when he did his manga for Nausicaa. Uh, you know, everybody knows Miyazaki for, you know, the stuff for Ghibli and his animations and films. But I actually find his manga from Nausicaa to be incredibly well executed. Uh, and so that one's really good, too. Go back up to the midsection because I know we're losing off the camera. I'll readjust in a moment. Let's just finish out these portions. Uh, we are going to be doing some watercolor, and that will help separate some of these elements. Uh, have I encountered a tone paper that can take fountain pens? Yeah, I've, there's tons of tone paper out there that can do it. Uh, the tone paper that we tend to use quite often, I don't have one here on me right now. Actually, maybe. So, uh, let's see. This paper here, let me zoom out a little bit. Is just a loose sheet paper and it's brown tone uh, as a earth tone paper uh, you'll find this online if you just go to Google and type in like environment paper cover stock or desert storm paper cover stock environmental paper cover stock it'll all be the same result essentially uh, but this is a kind of an earth tone brown tone paper it's not super dark it's a bit lighter but it comes in about a a4 size and up by 11 they're loose sheets, individual, and cover stock, meaning it's a heavier stock of paper. This is about a 100 pound paper. Um, so, you know, this will take fountain pen ink very easily. This is just using felt tip pen, but with a fountain pen, it'll also work just as fine. And it won't bleed, uh, it'll absorb well. It uses marker nicely, as you can see with this one marker here and there. Uh, this is some of the highlight tools like color pencil and uh, gel pen also too. The great thing about a tone paper and the reason why we use tone papers is so that we can go down in value and then up in value. So going to the darks and going into the lights. 
So with white paper, obviously, these are your lightest lights, the paper itself. As a brown tone, this is your 50% essentially, or like if we're being technical, like 30%. Um, and so we can go darker down to 50, 60, 70% of value, and then we can go up into the whites as well. So if you just Google this, you can buy a ream of this paper, like 250 sheets for like 30 bucks, uh, which is much more cost effective than like a spiral bound sketchbook or bound book, because some of those can be upwards of $20, $25. And you're only getting maybe 35 sheets or 40 sheets of paper. Uh, so if you're getting like 250 sheets, you might be able to get a lot more bang for your buck, potentially. Uh, Roman's asking, what is the enrollment for my classes and courses? Right now, actually, Roman's. So uh, if you guys don't know, classes that I run online of my own courses are in registration at the current moment. And uh, they will be going live. We'll have our actual first day of classes in the beginnings of February. February 6th weekend, I believe, when we start, I think. Let me check. February 6th weekend, yeah. So uh, if you are, if you guys are looking for classes uh, as ways to experience, you know, some of the base fundamental techniques, especially within dynamic sketching with a class that I teach, uh, those will be starting very, very soon. And so registration is open right now. And there's several ways of how you can experience the class. You can take the actually full enrolled class, which will give you feedback. And we meet eight weeks and each week is about three to four hours, if not more sometimes of live sessions. Uh, if you miss them, they are all recorded, so you can actually have access to the videos on the same day, so you can rewatch it again if you need to. Homework is actually uploaded into a Discord channel that I run for the class, and then of course, you know, um, feedback is also get, you know put it placed up there as well too. So there's a whole um, Discord channel that there's hundreds of people on there now from the years of classes online, and they help each other. It's a good resource, a lot of like um, support for sure. In terms of how you would enroll, you would go to my website. So if you just go to peterhunstyleart.com. Uh, you'll see classes and you'll see registration uh, access there or you can go to my Shopify store and they'll have the same thing. So I'm not sure if anything's sold out right now. I haven't double checked, but you can do a full enrollment or you can do a sit-in version. So a sit-in class is where you can do a lot of the drawing. You can listen to all the lectures. You have access to the same videos. You pretty much have everything except for feedback. So no feedback is given, but it costs a fraction of the price. So the good thing about the sit-in seat, uh, which tends to sell out a lot quicker, is that uh, it helps people stay involved in a creative environment where they can continue to really push their own you know, exercises and homework and skills, um, but not really have to feel fully committed to paying for a full class. What skill base do you need to have to take classes with me? Well, honestly, it's, I've had people from the very beginnings you know, uh, where they had never drawn before taking classes and they would pick up quite a bit. And we've had people that will come in with a little bit of experience of taking a few classes here and there. And then of course I've had professionals come into the classes and redo their uh, base fundamentals. So I've had different levels of tiers of experience and having taught for over 12 years, you know, I, I have the experience of dealing with all levels of that. So it's more based on if you're curious enough, if you have enough time and schedule towards it, if you're committed, of course, and financially ready to be able to, to you know, um, put into it then for sure, uh, you can jump in whenever you want to. Let's go down at the bottom, finish on his feet. This is gonna go off the page and that's okay. Let's go into the end of the tail over here. Let's see if there's any other questions. <clears throat> Will had asked, have I thought about putting another graphic novel out separate from The Blacksmith? Um, not so much. Not yet. I don't have a story that I'm really developing fully to that degree of level. 
I may not have worlds in which I could develop into something like that. Uh, for instance, one I would really like to maybe explore at one point in my life would be maybe the uh, Fish in a Forest st uh, series of stories. That could be a lot of fun. But the Blacksmith is the main one I've been developing so far. And I do want to do a second issue of Graphic Novel by hopefully in the next year or so. Um, this year will be the next Dynamite Bible. And I have another book I want to put out, which is kind of a, a fantasy journal, kind of like, you know, uh, natural history kind of book, you know. So we'll see where it goes. Hugo's asking, do you visualize poses and designs in your head when drawing from imagination? Sure, but it's based off of the experience level, right? Having uh, drawn from observation so much and, and observed many different kinds of poses, uh, I have a data bank full of that kind of stuff. I'm able to manipulate like a puppet, but it starts with initially having done a lot of observation. All right, what I'm going to do now at this point is... I'm actually going to take this, this head study here and this one here and push that line weight a bit heavier now because I want to separate these two elements, okay? So we're using the same pen and just kind of going over it. Not so much with heavier pressure, but with a bit of a back and stroke, back and forth stroke to get that line weight built up. So line weight itself can be used for multi-purposes. Uh, one, it could be something as simple as this, to push a line weight to help separate one from another one. So you can put one on top of the other as an overlap. And so initially you lose information as to what's going on. But if I'm able to use line weight to visually separate that entity using contrast, then it gives you a more clarified silhouette, right? Line weight can also be used to help create even simple uh, focal points. So if I said, you know, this specific area of the sketch in the drawing, if I want to give you attention to this area, I can push my line weight a bit heavier in this spot and then kind of let it gradate away as a thinner line. That can also create that sense of focal point, right? Um, line weight can also just be a, a way to kind of help control aesthetics. So it's, you know, a, a way it kind of visually stylistically looks to you. Just kind of going back and forth, back and forth, building that line weight. Because it's still a relatively thin pen, this one here. This is an F nib. So the single stroke, you know, I can get a bit heavier, but it's not as dense or as thick as I want it to be. So I need to go back and forth towards the strokes. Now you could just use a different pen, different sizing, and that's perfectly fine. So uh, MF is saying, you, you know, you're, you'll keep an eye out for the tone paper, but you get a lot of feathering from the Strathmore 400 series tone pan. I see what you're saying. Yeah, the, the, the Strathmore 400 series, it's a good paper. Um, it's a bit fibrous, but it's definitely thinner. So with a fountain pen, it can easily kind of pick up those fibers, which is why you'll get the feathering or the uh, bleeding of the ink. Um, so that way, with a little bit more of a uh, smoother surfacing, like the kind of paper I just showed you, it could work a lot better. Uh, well, it would work a lot better. The Strathmore is, is not so bad. I still find it to be relatively smoother than anything else. Like you wouldn't want to use craft paper. Craft paper is like super fibrous and textured. Not super, but enough to be see a difference. The Strathmore, I've used fountain pens before, but it could also be your pressure. I mean, if you press pretty relatively harder, using a metal tip pen, it can cut that paper up quite a bit. Uh, Matt's asking, can you recommend a white pen for adding highlights on tone paper? I do have, just offhand, I tend to use something like this. Uh, this is Presto, made by Pentel. It's a uh, correction pen, kind of like a whiteout, essentially. But I do use this for highlights. So this is actually one of the things you would actually add last to an illustration because it's an alcohol-based ink, so um, it doesn't work well with other water mediums. I also tend to use just the Prismacolor white uh, color pencil. Uh, 
I have a different size fountain pen that I could be using here, but I don't have it on me right now. It's in my other room, so I'll just use keep using this. Hopefully some of you guys are sketching with me now and creating your own little weird creatures or animals or drawings of things of different interests you have. If you do so, share them, you know, put them on your social media, share them and uh, talk about them, your experience and what you're sketching and drawing. Uh, on top of the online classes that I'll be running uh, starting in February, uh, I'm going to be going back and doing some in-person stuff here in Pasadena. So if you're in the LA area or near Southern California, and that's you know not too far enough of a drive, uh, that's something of a consideration. If you're looking for an experience of a class to work with somebody in person, I'll be running a class at the Blue Rooster Art Store. So that's uh, this place here, Blue Rooster Art. And... Um, We'll be doing classes again in person starting in February as well, too. Those will run actually this time around eight weeks. And so you get to draw with me in person in class, but we'll also get to go on location somewhere uh, on, on multiple occasions. And the registration for that should open up this coming week, next week. As we wrap up on this line weight, what I'm going to do is go back to the beginning a little bit and we'll do some watercolor stuff. Stay healthy, Vanzer. Hope you're doing okay. Uh, Will is asking, do you think there is a right time and a wrong time in an artist's learning journey to focus on direct drawing or is there a merit from the start? Uh, when you're saying direct drawing, are you talking about just taking something as you observe from a photograph and just directly translating it onto a page? Could you clarify that well for me? Because if that's the situation, then yeah, absolutely. It's a good training for anybody. Uh, the idea of copying and doing a direct translation from that piece to your actual medium of what you're doing uh, is a great way to be able to capture things like, you know, um, accuracy and, and obviously learning your tool sets and whatnot. So there's a lot of benefit from that. Uh, kind of practicing overall. Welcome Art of Jim. Uh, Will's asking to come to New York. Uh, well, you know, I was supposed to be in New York last uh, November for Comic-Con. The only reason I'd be in New York is probably for a convention. Uh, if there's any sort of school or workshop, I don't know of any. I could potentially do something with that. But at the moment in time, I don't have any places that I'm thinking of to go to. Uh, I don't know any East Coast places out there, uh, especially in New York. Uh, I've been, you know, to Florida for Comic-Con. But I do know there's a school out there, you know, Ringling's out there. Georgia has, you know, Savannah, but I'm not in contact with these schools. But, um, you know, like I said, in New York, I don't really know of any other places that could potentially host a workshop at all or talk. Uh, if you have any, all you have to do is recommend them, you know, to, to talk to me and then maybe I can talk with them from there, but they have to reach out. I would love to visit New York and more of the East Coast. Uh, I've been to New York, New York once when I was just a kid. Uh, I grew up in Ohio, uh, mid east, for a little for a good portion of my youth, and then from there I haven't really explored much of the east side of America as much. Been to Virginia a couple of times. I did a gallery show in uh, Washington D.C. and uh, Florida was just for a comic con, but that was about it. Uh, Z is saying that you just got uh, the Dynamic Bible from me from Lightbox Expo. Oh, good. I'm glad to see or hear that it's helped you quite a bit. 
again, uh, as people make comments about the Dynamic Bible, the second book will hopefully be out this year. So Will's clarifying that direct drawing as in going in straight to final line without underdrawing. I see what he's saying. So without an underlay sketch with pencil or marker, going directly in with whatever medium you're going for. Sure, absolutely. Um, as a kid, I used to draw things out of my head all the time without doing an underlay because I had no fundamental understanding what an underlay was. I would just draw what I was thinking of in my mind. Of course, it wouldn't always come out very good and there'd be a lot of inaccuracies and proportional issues, but it, it was just a good way to kind of train my, my mind to like think about what I wanted to do with it, right? So um, no matter what stage you're at, especially even as you're going through the educational route, doing direct drawing in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem I think at the moment, not even really a problem, but what's become an emphasis of focus for many people has been the idea of that's their goal. But what I do right now is what they want to be able to do. This is just an aspect of one way of approaching sketching and drawing that I'm able to do on top of many other approaches also. So um, people think that this is the the best and only way that artists should come to the conclusion towards their skill, which is what you'll see maybe from other artists out there that you think that, you know, you have to be able to only do this and this is the best way to do it. But it's not, right? It's just a way. Uh, and you have to find also then your way of what you find to be very approachable, but also very fun and entertaining. But because you, you see other professionals doing this, doesn't mean that's the way you should do it either as well, as well too. But th that also then means that you should experience the multiple different ways of approaching creating something whether it's direct drawing and doing some underlay, doing some pencil studies, using marker, using tracing paper, uh, whatever you'd want to use, you know? Back, back when I was in school, I used to do a lot of marker studies where I would do like these kind of splotches of shapes and silhouettes, and I would put vellum or tracing paper on top of that, and I would draw something from that shape and silhouette, being inspired by it. It was just an exercise. But that kind of stuff, I think, as a student going out there, is not really reinforced because you're never really exposed to it. Um, so when you're learning on your own, you tend to hear very kind of like, this is the best way to put it, um, curated packages of how things are done in a more kind of, not only just even consistent, but very common and standard approaches, you know? So when you don't really hear of other ways of doing it, you're never going to reapproach it. But that's why, you know, of course, going to a school is helpful because it, not necessarily like, like a class under a workshop or something like that, but going to a place where a lot of people convene because then you can see then how other people approach stuff, right? Jay Decker is saying, you're starting to feel overwhelmed trying to study the different fundamental topics every day. What's the best way to organize studying them? Anatomy, perspective, value, color, form, whatever the case is. Um, it's it's going to be very hard, obviously, no matter what. It's just simple as, I mean, not as simple as that, but the obviousness of it is that no matter what I say, it doesn't necessarily take away the frustration or the stress and the, and the difficulty of that approach in educational paths, which is that you have to learn a lot of these fundamentals. And it's overwhelming because you have to learn so much, you have to retain so much. And if you're not actively using them, then of course, how will you be able to, in any way, shape, or form, uh, have a sense of ownership to it, right? Of course, we can easily say time and patience is one thing. Uh, and that's definitely going to be a situation, of course, again, as an obviousness to it, which is that you just have to spend the time to build and nurture that skill set and how much time that will take. And that's another problem, which is there is no actual point of time in which you can uh, give yourself a goal to. For some people, it might take three, four years. Some people might take two years. Other people might take a lifetime. And some of these skills that you're trying to learn can be a lifelong endeavor. You know, there are some people that out there that were, um, you know, as instructors when I was taking classes at Art Center, who were very much into human form and studying anatomy. But for them, it was a lifelong endeavor. As, as much as they've taught and learned 30, 40 years, they still felt like they were picking up more things. So it never really ends at that point, right? But when you're trying to build all these different skill sets, I think really the only advice I can give is to be able to learn how to be able to overlap them together. Bring them hand in hand. Because what you're doing right now is you're, you're um, segregating them, right? You're saying form is form, perspective is perspective, value is value, and you know that these are fundamental skills that I have to use towards creating things that I want to generate at the end, but if you're not actually actively putting them together while you're learning, uh, then you're going to have a much tougher time trying to organize all it together, and you'll spend more time trying to actually incorporate them. What I'm saying is basically, when you learn these techniques, you take a class from them, right? And so the way I explain this in my class is like this. People treat taking their education and pathways of, of classes like a shopping list. I have to take perspective, color, value, anatomy, whatever, such and such, example, example, right? 
And so as you have a shopping list of stuff, you take a class like, okay, checklist, you check mark that one, I've taken it, done. And then you go on to the next class. So let's say you took perspective, check. Then you move on to, let's say, anatomy. Okay, I'm taking anatomy. Problem is, in anatomy classes, they're not going to be necessarily incorporating the uses of perspective fundamentals because it's isolating the idea of an anatomy study. So the student will then only focus in on what the instructor wants them to do based on that technique. But you're not then practicing your perspective. You're not incorporating your perspective. Now the question is, well, how do I incorporate that? Well, this is where you have to like maybe ask questions. You would then look for those kind of answers by having the curiosity to go research it, uh, to be able to actively look for other resources potentially as well too. Or just practicing perspective on the side while you were also doing the anatomy. And you had to be able to balance all those things day to day. Does that mean I'm sitting there for an hour doing perspective and another two or three hours of like anatomy? Potentially. But like I said, if you can find a better way to interlock them together somehow, that'd be great. Can I find some way to put the study of anatomical forms of bodies into a space and using perspective? Maybe, you know? Um, an artist and uh, figurative stuff that does that a lot is going to be Loomis. You know, Andrew Loomis does a lot of figurative work on proportion, but he uses primitive forms of cubes and cylinders and whatnot, but he puts them in perspective space. So I like what Loomis does when it comes to that incorporation of perspective and human form. But not all anatomists do that. But this is why you want to find as many resources as you can. So you, you yourself have to find a way to inter integrate those elements and, and themes of techniques together. Because a class won't necessarily do that for you if you're not built in a curriculum-based class. If you're going to an online source, you're taking a class here, then a class there from all different sources. And the problem is, because it's all separate, they don't they're not going to talk to each other, right? They're not going to build the same kind of curriculum. The instructors don't know each other. So of course, you're treating it as an independent, isolated experience. So how can you really then find a way to integrate them if the person in front of you is not going to do it for you? You yourself have to do it, right? But that's the, the thing about taking online classes that you are now pressured, well, put in the spot to be able to find a way to find a harmonious approach within all these things, which is why it takes longer and is much more tough. So, you know. So I'm just looking for any other questions here. Patrick, hey, welcome, man. Yeah, uh, you, when I was in Arlington in Virginia last time, uh, Patrick had stopped by for the gallery show that, uh, and also the slight workshop I had done. Um, yeah, you had missed that one day because you got sick. But I'm glad you were able to show up at least, you know, and hang out for a little bit and watch me uh, and work and ask questions. Uh, let's see. This is for any question that I can maybe answer here. Uh, you're two semesters away from graduating from a separate security degree. Hope that soon afterwards I'll have the opportunity to learn from, from you again. Do you plan to have more sessions uh, for my online classes after this upcoming one in February? Yes, I will. So I'll have more sessions of classes in the rest of the year. Uh, I usually will run four sessions a year. So I'm going into my first one starting in February. Uh, I have a whole calendar laid out right now. And the second one I think, think starts around May, I think. So we have a question from Ajax, which is, uh, what is the difference between the original dynamic Bible that I created myself back in 2016 compared to the new dynamic Bible published by Superani? And it's a good question because there is a massive difference between the two. Now, of course, Obviously, again, the content is the same within the idea of the technique of the dynamic sketching approach, which is a class that I've taught or do teach and I took from my mentor, Norm. Uh, the initial book is basically a, a all-in-one book. So it contains the multitude of subjects, all the exercises into one single novel, uh, basically one single um, collection, right? So it's got like, you know, six, seven different sort of subject matters and you know all the different approaches I do for them. But each section only really has like four or five pages you know, of, of content or information. So it's very minor of information um, and it's straight to the point of those things, which is fine, but it's also a bit dated, if anything else. So it's very much a shotgun blast of information, but not necessarily refined or detailed. So the new Super Ronnie version of it, when they asked me to do it again, is that I went in there to be a bit more detail oriented of specifically explaining those techniques of approaches of different subjects and the exercise that I have. So then, you know, this first book of the Superani book is only two subjects with exercises. And the next standard Bible will have three subject matters. And I'm going to do five different volumes of this. So we'll have, you know, upwards of seven, eight, nine more subjects being covered. 
but in a much more detail oriented, you know, uh, section of notes with drawings and sketches. So um, that's the big difference is that there's just much more data. Now, of course, the first time in my Bible was full color too. I did watercolor with them. It looks nice, but I found that to be an issue because now people were, were influenced by wanting the color of stuff. And color really isn't the focus in that I'm sketching. It's about being able to focus on shape and form and developing, you know, studies and whatnot. So um, I, that's why I kept it black and white too. So we're going to go back a little bit here. Right here. And we're going to do some watercolor on this one now. So I have my watercolor set. I have two water brushes. I get the towel. Now the things that we drew today were based on this head study and this new pose of this merman creature thing, which will potentially watercolor as well. But we're going to start over here first with this guy. So this brand of watercolor I have uh, is a European brand called Schmink. Nice watercolor set. I bought this tin uh, blank in Austria when I was out there like in 2018 or something like that. Uh, and all these individual watercolors I bought separately, then I put them in there. All the same brand. So this is just a water brush, meaning uh, the inside of it is just empty when you buy it and you fill it with water and you're able to squeeze it and the water comes out and you're able to clean the brush out with a napkin or paper towel. Color on this guy, uh, we'll go for a bit more of a light green to slight yellows and oranges, I think. It'd be kind of fun. Typically, I would think of like a blue or a green or something like that, but that's still typical. So I'm going to go with more of the yellowish and oranges and light greens. Let's do a base of a saturated yellow first. And I'm going to take the underside of his body to be much lighter. So the top will be more of this yellow and oranges. But the underside will be more of a light. So this is when we leave that white of the paper there. Top of the fingers. To the shoulder, maybe the top side of the bicep. Now, I've never used watercolor on this accordion book before, so I really wanted to test it out and see how it felt. A couple of questions. Jess is asking, does drawing and sketching help in filmmaking? And in my personal opinion, I believe it does. I believe drawing and sketching can help in any type or form of creative field, sculpting, photography, uh, clothing design, industrial design, filmmaking. Uh, I think sketching and drawing can fit in all those mediums in some way. Because what are we talking about? We're talking about communication, right? To communicate an idea, to communicate something that we've seen, to communicate something that we're you know, imagining, that we're able to show them instead of just verbally explaining it to them. And that's a very powerful skill to have, right? So imagine if you're a filmmaker, a director, and you're trying to communicate this scene to a person, you know, how it's going to be shot. Where do the markers need to stay? How is it going to be framed? How is it going to be composed? How is the lighting going to be done? Now, of course, you have people on hand maybe doing that for you, cinematographers, lighting people, prop makers, set people. But as the director, you can also communicate your concept. And they're able to maybe achieve the professional level what they need to get from them, right? So if you're able to give them not just a verbiage as to what you want from the idea, you can also maybe even remotely show them an idea of that concept visually, then it's much more powerful communicating tools. So even if you're in a, in a boardroom, in a meeting room with a bunch of people, you can't expect them all to be creatives. Let's say you're, you're trying to pitch an idea of some sort of like campaign, you know, you could just verbally explain something. And if campaign could be some kind of product design, it could be a campaign for some sort of like, you know, promotional thing, uh, whatever the case is, it could be in marketing. So being able to sketch and tell them, well, I'm thinking of graphically how we can compose pages like this or how we can maybe think about organizing like that. If you can just sketch it right there for them, it's a very powerful way of communicating, right? So uh, it's not about drawing it well either. I'm talking about drawing it well enough for them to visually understand as to what you're trying to say to them. If you think of sketching and drawing as a form of communication, 
It's not then about the aesthetics of making your drawing look good enough to sell as a gallery piece. It's a tool set to help you un help you um, have people on your side of understanding, essentially, right? To sell an idea. So absolutely, 100%. I think as a filmmaker, the ability to sketch and draw could be a big benefit. Who was a director uh, that does it well? Uh, Del Toro. Guillermo Del Toro usually has a sketchbook around and he sketches a lot of ideas and designs for his films. Uh, Cameron, James Cameron, he can draw very well also. He designs a lot of stuff for his own films, right? As we lay this base in, I'm gonna zoom in a bit more now. Just check my messages real fast. Okay, let's keep going here. I'm gonna add a little bit more of a saturated orange and yellow in some of these areas. I'm going to go to a more light green as I go into the inside of the body a little bit. I think I might only end up watercoloring this section. Uh, we've already gone about an hour and 15 minute in, so I would like to be able to maybe go maybe another half an hour at most. Uh, we're not going to go super long today because I got some work I got to do as well too. So. These kind of live streams, like I said, are just kind of a pop up. Um, but as I have other things I gotta responsibly take care of, <laughs> we'll be jumping into those too. Uh, and it's asking, have I seen the storyboards for Parasite? I have not. I've seen the film. Uh, I would like to see it. I'm sure it's pretty cool. The film was interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Hopefully it's not reflecting too much off of the light source here. Looks good on the monitor. Problem I have with watercolor when I'm recording like this sometimes is that it's so shiny from the water, it reflects it. So it's buckling a little bit. This is what I was kind of uh, curious about with this accordion book is how much of it would really buckle. Uh, I mean, this is about a 300 you know, pound paper for watercolor cold press. So it's probably going to react the same way as I have with any sort of watercolor paper. But being an accordion book, I'm kind of curious how to distort it. Uh, well, you're asking, uh, do I have a set streaming schedule at this moment? Is it more spontaneous? It's all spontaneous. This is why you want to follow my Instagram. Uh, whenever I post something, usually, you know, I post 10, 15 minutes before them on the live stream. I don't have set schedules. I probably would get a lot more viewers if I was, but to be honest with you, it's not, it's not really what I'm looking for. Uh, I just set a schedule of when I'm going to go on when I feel like it. <laughs> so this is all for my own personal interest. Um, yeah. <coughs> Again, welcome to you, all of you guys who are joining in now. 
if you're the first timer. Uh, these kind of streams, like I said, are going to be just mostly pop up most of the time. Uh, will I ever go back to a if I will I ever go to a scheduled kind of iteration? I don't know just yet. Mainly because you know my classes and otherwise take a lot of my time. So this is just again, like I said, more of a time for me to just interact with people here and there, uh, and sketch and draw whenever I need to. The channel's growing. I mean, it's not that it's not. You know, I, I have a decent amount of subscribers for my own kind of use of need. And um, I'm sure it could grow actively faster. But that's what I've liked about YouTube so far. Is that when I was young on Twitch, it was really slow growing. Like, if I was on it 24-7, I'm pretty sure it'd be fine. But uh, with intermittent, you know, live streams here and there, it was not really going anywhere. But with YouTube, um, because the audience... Is, is much larger. I'm having a lot easier time growing. Of course, you know, that the main goal here is just having another platform uh, to share more content, really, you know, even though it is monetized, it's not like I get a lot of money from it, honestly, <laughs> you know, it's like 10 bucks here, 20 bucks there. Um, I do it mainly because again I'm trying to set the not only the schedule but the the whole platform if it ever grows to a large larger substantial thing to already have all that stuff settled out. But I don't know if you guys have uh, recommendations of things things you would like to see into the future. I'm welcome to it. You know, some people have asked for like more reviews, which I'm not against. It just that it doesn't excite me the most. You know, doing reviews anymore. Because how many pens of reviews can I do? How many sketchbooks can I review? Because at the end of the day, they're not going to be that much difference. But I can understand, of course, for people that are coming up, they want to hear the specifics of them. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any you know recommendations of things you want to see more of from me and what you would like me to do with this channel, uh, let me know. At the moment in time, it's just giving me a, a chance to people to vocalize their thoughts and questions and uh, to be able to have interaction and, and just a talk of advice towards things, right? That's what it's all about so far. Just reading through some of the other questions if I missed any. Thanks for the feedback, Will. Uh, more on tone paper. Okay, tap for tank. Um, that's a recommendation of, of something you'd like to see or other people to be drawing on tone paper more. Uh, I would try to do that more. Maybe in the next stream, I'll consider that. With tone paper, you know, I can definitely just use ink and then going into the highlights. Uh, but yeah, it's fun to sketch on. If anything, if it's not just even sketching, it's more, be, more of like an illustration that we can do. Color doesn't work so well uh, on tone paper, obviously, you know, because it's tone. Especially with watercolor being a transparent medium. But if I use gouache, that could potentially be also nice. All right, let's jump into like more of a light green. Not a light green, more of like a earthier green. Transitioning into the underside of the body from that orange and yellow. So it'll be just a bit more of a gradient. With a lot of animals in nature, you'll get this thing called counter shading, uh, where it goes dark on top, light on bottom. So if you look at any animals on land or in water, they tend to follow that kind of color scheme, and they call it counter shade. So from what I've read, the counter shading approach to those animals is to be able to uh, take the light as it hits from the UV rays on top, and it kind of evens out the value of the silhouette. So it's a form of camouflage from what I understood. But I think it also helps with things like temperature control um, and whatnot. But for, like, for some animals like underwater, they can use it to their advantage, uh, you know, to kind of disguise themselves. 
So if you look at the you know, like down into the ocean, if you see a shark dark on top, it kind of blends with the darkness of the ocean depth. Uh, as you also look up and see the white belly, kind of mixes in with the lightness as well too. So birds will also do that. So then airplanes, uh, warplanes back in the day would kind of follow the same kind of color scheme, you know, dark on top, light on bottom. So this animal here, or this creature, I'm going to go a bit darker in the top regions, and then light, keep it this light to the bottom. I'm using very light amount of water with this because I don't want it to heavily buckle up on me too much. Thank you, Beckles. Appreciate you stopping by. Uh, you want to be able to see some more class demos, like with my dynamic figure, uh, Batman that I've done. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I could also potentially post that stuff separately, where it wouldn't be a live session where I'm doing it like right now. Uh, it will be reposting, essentially, content from classes that I've had as examples of how the classes are run. So that kind of stuff I can edit down as chunks and parts and be able to upload that separately too, as just content. Very much a possibility. Something I need to do more in regardless of it. Mainly because I think it helps sell the classes better. Uh, people have a better idea as to how the classes are run, uh, what they feel like, what we're, we're talking about, how we're approaching things. I think I, I've, I have uploaded a video even going into like feedback, how I give feedback to students. And that'll kind of show you how I, you know, talk about what they've done and how they can improve things and you know that also then gives them a good idea best thing you guys can do for me is basically to share you know share uh classes that you know of uh, or or you know you've taken with me or experiences that you've had uh and to be used that to um you know help me promote if anything else you know, for me, when it comes to stuff like this, I need to have as much, you know, help as I can to keep this whole engine rolling. Because, you know, I pretty much run everything on my own at this point. Uh, I do have help, you know, students that do come in and help me in terms of being able to manage like the Discord and whatnot and the volunteers. And, uh, you know, I, I give them an exchange of time and, and advice and feedback and whatnot, having them access to classes as well. Um, but yeah, having an independently run online school where I have to like promote and you know do the whole registration and getting everybody in line it's a lot of time and effort especially if I have to try to market as much as I can it's a hard thing to do okay let's go a little bit darker now I'm going to go into the I'm going to mix here kind of like the scarlets and reds mix it in with this orange right here the yellow this is like a lemon yellow it's getting a little bit darker I'm going to use a saturated red as a darker value to go in between some of the crevices and also darker regions of areas. So adding just shadow is not really just about adding just black, you know, and grays, but using saturation and colors as well can be really good. <clears throat> uh, Auto Jim is asking me, do I ever use limited palettes with watercolor? Uh, not necessarily. We used to do a lot of limited palette paintings when I was a student at school. Um, in the beginning, you know, we kind of go from like the monochrome uh, value paintings to monochrome, then limited palettes, then full, you know, paintings. Um, but these days, I tend to just go full palette. With watercolor, but I do try to keep it simple if I can. 
if it ends up being where it's a, almost like a limited palette kind of result, then that's just based on the fact of, you know, uh, logical choice of how I want the colors to be organized in this thing, you know. So I can even go for like cool shadows and whatnot, but I might just keep it to just the worms. But I definitely allow myself to, you know, think about where the palette will go. All right, let's go to this region here. So the pectoral chest area kind of push that darker value a little bit, the red in the chest. I'm also going to play with maybe some striping and patterning maybe on him a little bit. This actually takes water pretty well. So this is just a regular loose sheet. You're seeing well, maybe a little bit of buckling right there in the back. But once I collapse this and put some pressure on it, that should even out actually. So it handles water mediums pretty well. This is a watercolor paper, um, but it's doing a pretty good job. I was worried that it was gonna be like warping like crazy. So I'm thinking about like spots and patterns and stuff like that on them as well too. And on the side of the leg and kind of think about striping like this. And it'll be subtle as it dries. <clears throat> hey Faisal, how's it going? Uh, do I have a favorite fountain pen these days? It's still this new brand or brand that I'm using, not a new one. It's been around for a long time. It's the uh, Esther Brook pen. <laughs> Esther Brook is a fountain pen company based in the U.S. But it's good. I like it. down a little bit let's hit it with the nice strong more for the eye area just a little bit of color in between areas of the teeth and now I'll start to come in here with a bit of a darker value like a brown and burnt umber as it matches that warm tone. <clears throat> and go into these shadow areas and just kind of punch that down a little bit. So just kind of grouping these value areas together, making the silhouette of the arm stick out a bit more, more here. Excuse the sniffling, I'm suffering from allergy issues today for some reason.
So any areas that feel a little bit noisy and complex and drawing the eye too much, I just kind of use that value grouping to kind of group it together like this. that arm back. I'm going to focus a heavy contrast up into this front area. As it goes back, I'll do a little bit less of it. Lighter, not as dark. See a couple of the questions here. Uh, Tyler, the tank is asking, have I been shooting the recurve bow? Any, uh, I used to shoot all the time. I need to start again. Yeah, um, I have a recurve. I don't shoot it as much. It's about a 55 pound draw. And uh, I've been using mostly my traditional bows. I have a long bow, European style long bow, which is at 60 pound draw. Uh, I have a new bow, which I just got from the same maker, a boyer, who made me a Comanche style bow, which is a short draw. And that's also about 60 pound draw. I have two Asian bows. One is a Mongolian, one is a Korean bow. Those ones are much lighter. Uh, the Korean bow is about 40 pound draw. The Mongolian is about a 35 pound draw. So those ones are more fun for shooting recreationally. I need to keep training to get more comfortable using the long bow and the Comanche bow. I can definitely pull them. Um, it, it takes a bit more strength, obviously, but uh, I do find it to be enjoyable, but it's definitely a learning curve because it's so traditional. You know, you don't have the same kind of like, you know, um, components that could be using on a more common uh, current bow. But it's fun. I don't shoot from very far away. I'm just shooting in my backyard, so I, can, I don't want to put too much distance from me to the target. Uh, I don't want to lose an arrow. Um, so I'm only shooting from like maybe 30, 40 feet away. But I do need to go to a range more so I can get about up to like 70, 80 feet and see how I can do from there. But I still very much enjoy uh, shooting for the archery. Uh, problems down the line is asking, I'd like to see a sketchbook tour or two and also like some sort of walkthrough of my dynamic Bible. I feel like the description of the other websites are kind of weak covering it. It's a good recommendation. I, I really like hearing that. Uh, thanks for the, the um, suggestion. I definitely could be doing so. Not so much on just the, the tours of sketchbooks, which I can easily do. But, you know, definitely doing like the whole explanation and walk through the book. I've done it before. Um, I can't remember where I put it up there. I thought I had put it on my, on my YouTube. Maybe not, though. But that's something I can maybe even do next time. So for sure, I'll keep that in, in consideration at some point soon. Patrick asking, have I ever used diluted ink to shade black and white drawings? Yes, ink washes I've done. Uh, you've been using that more. Uh, and that and the technique with using watercolor seems similar to it. It's very similar for sure, because with watercolor, you're also diluting the level of saturation with water. And so you could be doing the same kind of thing. Ruben's asking, uh, curious to know if you've experimented with any other kinds of design work, like logo design, type of design, or 3D modeling. I've done logos. I've done eyewear design, industrial design. So eyewear frames I've designed in the past. Uh, I work for a company out in Italy. Um, for about five years and it was a company that was also built by my mentor Norm. So I helped with things like marketing campaigns and you know, eyewear design and packaging and also things like booth design. That kind of stuff I've done quite a bit as well too. Uh, so I've been experienced in many forms of design uh, from illustration work to gallery work to book designs. Uh, for sure, a lot of different stuff. Logos a little bit here and there but not an extensive amount of logos. Logo design I find to be very difficult <laughs> because it's, it's got to be so uh, simple yet clear to the branding, which is why many logos fail. I've done some tattoo work here and there, you know, done some illustrations with people using tattoos. I don't do it very regularly. I don't do it for just people who are off the street. Mostly only people that I know, like family members or friends that are very close would ask me for something like that then maybe I would but like tattoo design work I don't really touch as much at all 
but I've had people take my, my illustrations and sketches and get tattoos of them. Uh, you know, that's their choice. Sorry, I'm off the screen right now. Okay, let's hit it with a couple of different areas of color just to have fun with it. Uh, I did. I said I wouldn't maybe use so much blue, but I think I will a little bit here. Blues and greens, just for a little bit of color fun around some of the areas for the animal, the creature. The thing about color is that once you kind of get the value situation kind of settled, color is experimental. It, that's just more subjective. You can do whatever you want with it. Color is very much more based on things of like feeling to aesthetics, storytelling. But to paint well, you gotta know value. So a little bit of that kind of sky blue, using a bit of the turquoise. Using a good amount of water, but again, just kind of dabbing it around here and there. It's not necessarily like lighting or value structuring, it's more just color to play. And it could be more surface level, skin color to the uh, scaling color here, patterns and stuff like that. See, a couple of the questions, which ink was I using? I was using that Platinum Carbon Ink, this one again. Platinum Carbon Ink. Yeah, another uh, request for the Dynamic Bible walkthrough. That's something I can do maybe next time. So I would say hopefully maybe even this week? What is today? Thursday? Maybe next week. Yeah, today's Thursday. So maybe on Monday. Next week, I'll do another live stream. And if you guys are interested, hop on in. Uh, I'll probably try to, try to do a sit down of the Dynamic Bible and kind of do a talk through about it. How to use it, you know, the history of it. If I was a student, how would I engage with it? Those kind of things. I was thinking of doing a card opening tonight as well, too. Uh, these kind of live streams, again, like I said, are, are opportunities for me to interact, but also to engage in my hobbies of stuff. So I have a box of cards here I want to open up, and it's a very expensive pack, very expensive pack. Um, I'm thinking about just doing it live here while I'm talking with you guys. Just to have it recorded. Who knows what I'll pull. It's a very expensive pack. I sold a lot of sneakers to get it. <laughs> I have a lot of sneakers in my collection as well too. So I got rid of some sneakers I wasn't wearing in that uh, in my collection. Just like so that's how I engage in other hobbies, right? So if I've, of of an interest of another kind of hobby that I have, instead of pulling from money that I have to pull from my account, I want to usually pull from my investments of other collections that I have. So um, you know that's how I usually do it. Uh, question here is, can you explain how when you draw something that then when you put a mirror on it or flip it looks different? I know bad question, but no, 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 it's it's uh, actually a good question because this is a very common thing that can happen in, in a, not in amateur's of work, in any person's artwork, even mine, okay? And this is usually things that you're trying to sketch that are very symmetrical. Let's say the person's face. We are symmetrically built animals, right? So when you try to draw a person, and um, it may not have to even be front view. It could almost be even like a three-quarter view of this creature here. If I mirrored this the other way around, it wouldn't really be as distinctly offsetting when you look at this particular character or creature flipped the other way around, mainly because we're talking about a creature that doesn't exist, right? It's an imagined thing. So you'll be able to accept the way it looks from the flipped iteration. But if I took a human's face, a person's face, and I drew it, and then I mirrored it, because of human error, our inability to control symmetry or scaling or placement, uh, and things can be off a little bit, it may look okay from the, from the angle of view that we're looking at it from now, 
but as soon as we flip it, we don't notice some of the distinct issues and problems. But it reveals them to you as you flip it and mirror it, right? Uh, because you're looking at it from a new vantage point, essentially. So then you start to see a lot of the problems rise up due to that situation. Uh, but this is common. Every person who goes into the venture of developing sketches and drawings and designs faces that issue also. Uh, something that I can you can face up to even being a, a, a very experienced professional. Now it becomes a less, um, I guess, it doesn't pop up as much. Because when I was a student, this would happen all the time, right? You would try to draw a character, you put it into Photoshop, and you flip it, it's like, oh, I look terrible. But it's because, again, alignment, scale, proportioning, distance of things, position of stuff is all kind of slightly mismanaged. So how would you do it in terms of a digital approach is that we would actually draw things digitally, and we constantly flip back and forth, just so we can see it on both sides and be comfortable or, or confident that both sides work. Now, in analog drawing, that's really hard to do, right? Uh, how I used to do it when I was a kid, I would draw on paper, and I will pick it up and put it in front of a light source, and I would, you know, have it, I would see the underside of the page, just see, just to see how close I was with it or how off I was. Um, but a lot of it is also the construction, how it helps in terms of how to get over that. The constructive approach of building things is really the key. Knowing landmarks, practicing your proportions, uh, getting a good sense of anatomy, basic level if you have to, at, at the very least, and then of course constant practice, right? Uh, and looking at other people's work, seeing how well they do it, and through experience alone, you'll be able to have less of those elements pop up. But it's, like I said, it's a very common thing. Again, the reason why I bring up the human thing is because it's something that we see every day as humans. With humans, because we're, we're familiar to the way a general proportioning of a person is, we notice slight like, issues of them easily in a sketch and a drawing. But in a creative thing, it doesn't matter as much, right? But we don't have nothing to compare to easily. But with people, we do. So we no notice slight issues that happen because of it. Photographs, we always saying, yeah, that helps. Can help for sure in a drawing and sketch. Uh, we're just going to be going a little bit further on this, not much longer. It's about, we've been an hour 40 into this right now, so we're not going to go that much longer. Uh, my allergies are kind of killing me today. And that's why I might end up short a little bit here today in this situ uh, se session in the moment time being. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, something's hitting me. Yeah, Supersonic was saying uh, getting proportions right is tricky, even if you know the rules. Absolutely. Because it takes your eye. It's all eyeing of information. And if you can't eye it well, well or even if you practice it a lot, you can still mistakenly, um, you know, capture it on the page, even minutely, because of just human error. So if you run into those issues, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> because... It's a standard thing that we all experience. All right, let me zoom out a little bit just so we can get a sense of how this looks overall. Oops. Let's cover just some of the fish real fast. Goliath fish. Spotted bass are usually kind of more of a warm tone brown to oranges as well, too. Let's make it a little bit of a different warm tone, though. Just on the top of the body here, adding a little bit of water, letting it spread around.
this is a bit more water in this area, so it's a mix of different sort of pigments that spread, it blends together. Okay, so just one fish in place. I'll probably hit a few of these a little later on. I just wanted to get enough onto the page to get started. So we did this earlier, uh, earlier we, in the stream, we did a sketch and a drawing. We did a watercolor on this piece. So I think we got enough content covered just to get a bit of diversity of stuff in place. Uh, any tips for using watercolor or instructional books you know of? Um, not a lot out there when it comes to watercolor. I mean, there is, but a lot of it is going to be like hobby-based kind of stuff. Uh, you know, kind of very basic instructional. I can't think of any on my, top of my head that I use myself personally for watercolor kind of work. A lot of it is just playing with the materials. You know, the more I play with it, the more familiar I get with the actual medium. And I'm able to manipulate it in, in using the basic fundamental techniques of painting. So if I even just, if you took a book on color, lighting, or painting techniques of other mediums, they can be translated and brought over to even things like this kind of watercolor stuff. So um, it's something to consider. It doesn't have to be specifically just watercolor books. You could be using other resources as well, too. You know, it, it, with watercolor stuff, I do instruct, I have instructed it in my um, advanced class that I'm sketching in advance. I don't really have it as much in my other classes. Um, in my dynamic sketching class, I thought about even just bringing it in as just more of a demo and as more of a lecture, but I don't have a dedicated watercolor class per se. Uh, something I might want to do more into the future, but at this point in time, I don't have it just yet. So. But if anybody has any recommendations of books that they would you know, advise, uh, take a look at it. But for myself personally, I don't really have any other out there. But it's just simply really playing with it. Like the more you just use it, you just get familiar to the way it works, the way it feels, the way it kind of like um, moves on a page. You know, for the color book, a lot of people would recommend like the James Gurney book, which I would definitely recommend as well too. Uh, his YouTube and his also uh, social media streams are awesome. You know, James does a lot of demos and stuff like that. So he's someone I'd be looking at. Yeah, so Yoon Gyu's, uh, or Yoon, uh, I got heart, I have my name, <laughs> sorry. I'm looking at YouTube handles and names like this. But anyways, Yoon is saying that, yeah, James Gurney, for sure. There's still a bit of like adjustments and cleanups and things I got to do here in some of these areas, uh, which I'll do so later on in my own time. But we're about wrapped up here.
Just getting the last bits of fish here and there. Which is just single value, light wash, dark on top, light on bottom. Uh, Will's asking, how would you recommend artists weigh practice, uh, weigh practice versus production while building their skills? Um, you know, for me, when it comes to stuff like that, to be honest with you, it's like you got to be able to engage in both, you know, because if you only practice and you, and you push your skills as much as you can training wise, you're never going to feel completely ready. Like you're saying, oh, I'm good now. I can now start producing things. That's never going to really happen. Uh, and vice versa, you can, you know, just try to produce illustrations and never really train. And you're not going to be able to actually handle uh, all the different necessary skills you got to build. So in that situation, it's more about training as much as you can and try to apply it when, when applicable in that situation at the moment. So you shouldn't necessarily segregate one or the other, either two. Uh, I would build off of each other as you can. Again, an actual production piece can also be a learning experience, and I would treat it as such as well. Balance is key. It's not about independently focusing on one or the other especially whether it's the educational route or even developing actual content and production of pieces. Uh, everything is going to need some form of development, which is the idea. Process. Okay. Okay, just to uh, recap. This was the start of my newest accordion book. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So we just opened it up and I started this sketch yesterday. I kept pushing it, pushing it, and then we got into today, which we developed uh, this new head study and another pose of this merman creature. And this will keep going. Uh, this accordion book, I have to, you know, obviously you have to get going on and get started on it uh, but it should be done hopefully within a maybe this month or, or two uh, I have two of these filled up both sides and I have another one filled up as well too so I have a total of three accordion books filled this will be the fourth one and I'm gonna keep going with these accordion books I have a fifth empty one head pot for handy as well too I'm, I'm just really liking the format so we'll keep going with it yeah there it is so far Robert, welcome. Uh, you're joining in at 6 a.m. in the Netherlands. That's awesome. How's it going, Life Cooper? Zess, you're asking, any recommendations for learning perspective? When in this situation of or questions I get, I always recommend classes, of course. And you might think, well, I don't, can't really take classes. I don't have any around me. Well, we we'll definitely go online. You think, well, I can't really afford it. I can only go for books. And yes, you can learn by teaching yourself by going through books and tutorials, but it only takes you so far. Because having someone there hands-on to show you the approach and application really helps you go beyond the just the reading of the content. You can just read it and just study from out of a book. But like I said, it's very one-sided and it doesn't give you a deeper appreciation or application that's really kind of necessary. So classes are the main thing, really. Because with the classes, it's a format where you can don't only learn from a teacher, but you also learn from each other, other, other students. So as other people that are starting with you, you see the approaches of how it can be done by different sort of eyes, right? So I would recommend that highly. Okay, we're just going to put this aside for the moment. Uh, I'm actually going to do a quick card break uh, as I'm still talking to you guys. If you want to keep chatting, we'll stay here for the last maybe like 15 minutes or so. I'm going to break this card box open real fast. I want to see what I got in here. Life is uh, saying very excited today. Uh, you got... Now for a storyboard project on a music video. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Um, hopefully it's a good project. And hopefully it's a, a one that pays well. <laughs> and one that also brings you more work than anything else, right? Uh, let's see. I just need a couple things. I got sleeves. And this is to help me reveal what I have. So I'm just uh, going to be doing some Q&A now. Uh, anybody has any questions and stuff, I'll keep answering too. But while we're doing so, I'm going to just kind of break open a box of cards. Just my own personal hobby. Jung is also asking, what do you think about just making personal pieces and using references instead of just studying uh, for the sake of studying? I mean, what's wrong with that, right? 
if you're saying as a student, should you maybe not allow yourself to experience that mainly because you should be only practicing? I would hope not, you know? Um, because as a student myself, as much as I would train, I very much allowed myself to sketch, draw, create as much as my own thing. Um, in a lot of ways, when you're doing your personal work, it's a chance for you to also pull in the experiences of your class techniques and try to use them, right? That's how I would, how I would use it, basically. So your personal pieces and personal studies are not just ways of taking a break. It's a way for you to also, um, you know, practice your actual skills. Sorry, off camera. This is a, a pack of NBA cards and um, I got a redemption in here. And we'll see what I got in this one. I'm really into sports also. So as I'm into sports, uh, I'm into collectibles and trading cards and stuff like that. So as I'm talking with you guys and answering questions, uh, I'm really just doing this for myself. <laughs> so Life uh, Cooper is asking, you know, you, you recently just got a, a job for storyboarding for a music video, but now you're also asking, you know, um, any recommendations or any tips? You know, storyboarding is a much different venue. So um, I'm assuming, Life Cooper, that you've done some work in storyboarding, or is your first job in that? Because if you're first, then you know, of course, I would very much rely upon working with the art director to get as much direction as possible. I would say, if anything, in terms of a tip, communication will be key. And when it comes to storyboarding, yes, drawing better and knowing your composition and storytelling and all that kind of stuff is going to be good perspective or otherwise but I think communication talking to your director talking to your producer talking to anybody there to help you along with that is going to be really really helpful because the more you communicate and clarity you have within what you're doing less chances of mistakes will happen because if you don't talk enough then what happens is um, you just miscommunication and assumption and as you assume that's what the shot or the or the piece is supposed to look like as you produce it it may not be aligned to what they're going for right so if you feel a little bit lost or confused and not sure what you want to do, don't feel embarrassed to ask as much as you can, all right? So I would really recommend that as, as, as you know approach towards your first um, storyboarding project. I'm not going to talk about this as much. Um, this is just, like I said, for me, so. <laughs> but I hope that helps, Life Cooper. Um, it doesn't seem like much. I know that you might want to hear more about technical kind of things, though, but, but if you already got your first job from this, I'm assuming you apply, either apply for it with the work you already have and prove your ability to sketch and draw. I wouldn't worry so much about that because, uh, you know, why else would they hire you unless they felt comfortable enough to hire you for your skills? But in terms of the advice as your first job and something like this, as I said, be open to talk more, okay? Communication is everything here. Uh, Will's asking, you like to know some of my favorite Western comic artists. Uh, growing up in high school, so you get these patch cards where you get actual, um, sometimes game worn. This is game worn patches from these players. I'm looking for specific players. I'm looking for specific teams. Um, Rookies would be great. These will have autographs in there as well, too. This is why it's an expensive pack. It's because there are autographs in them and patch cards. But a lot of these can be, you know, the first one was a base card here. And this is an early patch card, a memorabilia card for the college. So I'm looking at the last two cards, and this comes with only six. The last two cards should be the ones that hopefully will be better or strongest. Something like that. So this is a double patch. Three of seventy-five made of these, and this is a player, and this is a player which I really like because these are rookies, Cade and Evan, Mobley. So this is a strong card here. It is an ex it's it's a very expensive hobby. <laughs> uh, dare I say, almost like gambling. 
Um, but the thing is, you know, I'm usually selling off things that I have in my own collection to afford this kind of stuff. So I, I sold off a lot of my other stuff to pay, pay for these. The finals this year in NBA? Uh, well, the, the team that I follow is, is the Blazers, and they're not going to get there. I mean, they'll get to the playoffs, but they're not going to compete enough to make it to the finals. Um, I mean, right now, who is the top teams? We have the Bucks aren't on the top anymore. You have the Celtics, but the Nuggets, I think, probably could take it again. Uh, Yoki could probably be MVP again, too. The Nuggets are pretty strong. <laughs> you know, They're kind of unbeatable, I think. So what favorite Western comics, uh, when I was in high school growing up and I used to copy and draw all the time, I would sit in, in, a, in a restaurant, in a diner with my friend Izzy all the time. We'd sketch together. And the artist we used to look at constantly, uh, thanks Romans, was Joe Mad, Joe Madrera. This is his autograph. Malcolm McBride, rookie card too. 299. Joe Mad was someone we used to look at constantly. We really enjoyed his style, his aesthetics, and uh, the books that he worked on, which was mostly X-Men books in the beginning. Then he had his own series called Battle Chasers, which I you know, I liked quite a bit as a, as a young kid. So I'm trying to get these in the sleeves. So he was cool. Uh, just recently, today, I started following um, an artist that I've, I've looked at for many, many years, even since from the time when I was in high school. And I think he's only just been recently active on Instagram, but it's Travis, Travis Cherist, C-H-A-R-E-S-T, -E -E as his last name, Cherist, or Karis. Um, Travis is an amazing illustrator, and comic artist, and he was kind of been absent for a while. I don't know what it is he does, but um, I, I recently just found his Instagram, and I started following him, and uh, I love his posts. So he's someone I would also look at as well, too. This is the second to last card. PJ Warren. The last one, I know what it is already. Yeah, it's a rookie. And I think it's a good one. And these are the redemption cards. So it tells you what it is. You have to scratch this off and redeem it. So this is a rookie patch autograph. Red. There's a certain numbering of that. And Kaminga is a player, which I have his rookie card right here actually the same player so this one I got in a previous opening this is out of 99 so is this player here in this pack which is a good player to have um, and it's a rookie patch and autograph so that's great problem is with these redemptions out of this company called Panini which is where they make them uh, you can try to redeem it but it takes forever to get them so even though I don't have the card sometimes what I'll do is I'll sell this one uh, just to make back a little bit of money, you know, because it's not a player that I really want. But these two autographs are kind of whatever, but that patch is a nice one right there. That one. All right, anyways. Uh, yeah, Cher so people here talking about Cheris right now. Yeah, he was, he's, he's a beast, that guy. He was crazy. Yeah, most of his stuff is traditional analog he did a, a great comic a series it was a x-men collaboration with wild storm the wildcat series and there was a character in there her name was zealot and it was a, a comic with her and wolverine together and it was set in like world war ii 1940s it's a really great series and i used to have that in, in uh in high school this is like in 98 97 when i had that comic man i used to look through that comic constantly it was all done by travis beautifully illustrated I don't have the book anymore. I'm looking to actually buy it again because I, I, it got damaged. It got water damaged. So I wanted to get a new copy um, just so it's a better quality. All right, Jimmy. <laughs> I was in the, the Blazer game. I was watching it courtside uh, when I was visiting my family up in Portland. Uh, we were watching them play the Charlotte Hornets. It was great to watch. Um, I've been to one other NBA game in the past. I was invited to a, a suite for a job thing that I was doing. To watch the Clippers, but it was the Clippers. So just this year, I went to go see the Blazers for the first time. And I've been watching them for years. So, but anyways, yeah, that's a, a, an artist from the Western side that I really find um, 
you know, to be very enjoyable. There's many, many others too, but either way. This is why, like, when I go to, like, Comic-Cons and stuff like that, you know, I like to meet some of them. Recently, I met with an artist that I really, really enjoyed uh, growing up with, which was um, Art Adams, Arthur. Arthur, I've always loved his aesthetic and his work quite a bit. And um, it was nice to be able to at least just chat with him and talk with him and give him some stuff and read the trade. And uh, it was cool to also have each other, you know, have him follow me and I follow him. So these are kind of the artists that I looked at as heroes, you know. So as I got older and established, you know, what I do, to have a chance to build this kind of like relationship and at least a network has been the best thing, you know, for the last couple of years. Use the ability to make these kind of connections. So very much for sure, you know, that kind of stuff I like a lot. But yeah, Art Adams, amazing stuff. Travis Karras, amazing. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, so we've gone about two hours now. So uh, at this point, I think we're going to end this session. I appreciate you guys hanging out for a little bit. Uh, what we're going to be doing is that next Monday, I will most likely be doing another stream, kind of going through a... Um, Kind of an overview of the dynamic Bible, you know, kind of show you a walkthrough on how I would use a book like that. And so that way, um, it'll help you guys maybe even try to find a way to incorporate better to your techniques and lessons and uh, give you a chance to also ask more questions, okay? So next Monday, I think maybe what time, I don't know, hopefully around before or after lunch, maybe earlier in the day would be nicer so that we, people international can also be a part of it. Um, but in any case, probably next week, Monday around 1 or 2 p.m., you'd probably be good. My time Pacific. So join if possible. And if not, I will see you all in the next session. Thank you guys.